Hi, everyone. Welcome to Foresight Intelligent Corporation Group. Thank you so, so much for coming, everyone. And this was a much expected seminar. Thank you so, so much, Stuart, for making it. Here is your bio, courtesy of ChatGPT4. Stuart Russell is a British-American computer scientist who is well-known for his contributions to the field of artificial intelligence. Born on May 28, 1962. Did I get that right? No? No. <laughs> no. Made, <laughs> made that one up completely. Okay. Let's see what else is wrong here. I think a few of the other bits are correct. In Portsmouth, England, he learned yep. his BA in physics from the University of Oxford and a PhD in computer science from Stanford University. Russell is a professor of computer science at the University of California, Berkeley, and is recognized for his work on machine learning, probabilistic reasoning, knowledge representation, planning, and robotics. He's perhaps best known as the co-author with Peter Norvig, who also presented to this group before several times, of the widely used textbook AI, A Modern Approach which is considered a standard reference in the field of AI. In addition to his academic work, Russell is an advocate for developing AI systems that are aligned with human values. And he has written and spoken extensively about the potential risks and benefits of AI. His 2019 book, Human Compatible AI Intelligence and the Problem of Control, discusses the need to ensure that AI systems are designed in a way that prioritizes human well-being and long-term safety. Any other mistakes in there that you spot? Well, I think that the rest was okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, we give it a pop. No, seriously, thank you so, so much for joining. I know that especially right now in the current, yeah, heydays, your guidance and thoughts are more appreciated, I think, than even than usual. Like, it's coming really tiny that we're having the seminar now. I think many people here also watched or listened to the podcast episode with Gary Marcus. So let's see if we get into some of this as well. But for now, I'm just, yeah, delighted that you're here. Thank you so, so much for joining this group. It's a real honor and, and delight to have you here. Thank you so, so much for taking time. We look forward to your presentation. And I'm already going to be in the chat monitoring for questions for you, of which I'm sure there is no shortage today. So thanks a lot. Take it away. And I'm in the chat. Thank you, Surat. Okay. Thank you, Alison, very much. Yeah, I really wish we could do these things in person, but I guess this is this is a pretty good substitute okay so let me make sure i get i have a lot of powerpoints open okay so i want to just begin by talking about how we have thought about ai historically of course it was about making intelligent machines and in the 40s when many of the basic ideas were were being formulated the notion or the connection between intelligent behavior and rational behavior was was very strong and very very current both from economics with work by von neumann and morgenstern for example and in philosophy with with ramsey and many others and and so i think this notion that what we mean by intelligent is that it does the right thing was quite pervasive and and that really led to the way we think about ai as machines being intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. So when, when you read many of the formative papers of AI in terms of reasoning correctly, John McCarthy's early paper on the advice taker, that it would come up with a plan for getting to the airport that worked, and then it would carry out that plan and so on. And this model, for, this, for similar reasons, also became pervasive in first in cybernetics and then in control, in control theory, in operations research in economics and so on this this notion that you specify objectives and then you create optimizing machinery that achieves those objectives and and off they go and of course the the goal was always not just to get to the airport or to to beat the human chess champion but general purpose ai meaning that one ai system would be able to do all of these things anything that the human mind is is applicable to ai systems would be able to do and in fact that idea even goes back to to lovelace and babbage in the 1840s so the question what if we succeed i think is is a really important one and it's actually a section of the first edition of the textbook from back in 94 and in that section i talk both about the upside and the downside but when you read it, that 1994 section, it, it has a very hypothetical feel to it. It's pretty clear back in 94 that I wasn't thinking this was going to happen anytime soon. So it's, it's really just thinking about a, a fairly distant future. But if we did have real general purpose AI, and I don't think we do yet, but we're certainly moving towards it, we could clearly use it to do 
what we already know how to do by definition. Right? We already know how to deliver a, a decent standard of living to hundreds of millions of people on earth, but we don't deliver it to everybody with general purpose AI because it, it takes all the costs out of the entire supply chain, all those expensive humans out of the supply chain, we could deliver a high standard of living to everybody on earth. And that would be about a tenfold increase in GDP. And the net present value of that, so if you think of that as the a discounted future income stream, the net present value is about $13.5 quadrillion. So that's a, a lower bound on the cash value of creating general purpose AI technology. So that gives you some feeling for the level of motivation of some of the players in this, whether they're major governments or major corporations, of the kind of momentum and incentive that's built into what's turning into an arms race. And then, of course, we could have more things, right? We could do things we can't currently do because giving, giving access to greater intelligence than we currently have, and, and in some sense, unlimited numbers of greater intelligences, we could have much better individualized and accurate healthcare, individualized and, and very effective tutoring-based education for every child on earth. We're already seeing more rapid advances in science coming from this technology. And of course, it would be much better in the future. So, so that's all great. People worry about this, which is that if you turn over all the management of your civilization to machines, instead of, excuse me, instead of to the next generation of humans, then we lose the incentive to, to educate the next generation. We lose the incentive to, to know how our own civilization actually works, and we end up infantilized in the way shown in WALL-E. So that's a longer conversation that's not really part of what I'm going to talk about today. So since the 40s, there has been a lot of progress. John McCarthy dreamt about a car that could drive them to San Francisco airport. And now that's entirely possible. And we see these vehicles in quite a few cities. There's still some way to go before it's a ubiquitous technology, but progress has been very, very significant. This is some work from our own group. This is the detection of a North Korean nuclear explosion by a system called NetVisa, which we developed and it's now the monitoring system for the nuclear test ban treaty running at the United Nations in Vienna. And it's actually not a deep learning system at all. It's a giant Bayesian probabilistic reasoning engine developed using what's called a probabilistic programming technology. And that technology is so powerful that it took me less than half an hour to write the system. So, so that's an interesting subject that I'll come back to later on. And now we have the, the generative AI. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of bored of chat GPT conversations, so I'll just show you one of my favorite pictures. Teddy bears mixing sparkling chemicals as mad scientists in a steampunk style. So that this is from Dolly and in a few seconds produces this image. And there's a couple, it's not absolutely perfect. There's some slightly weird bits, like why that one of the teddy bears has a foot on the end of his arm instead of a hand. But the amazing thing, but besides the fact that it can it can read and understand that prompt and then put this all together, and it's quite a, I think, a pretty impressive result. This system does not have any graphics rendering software, right? Usually, if I want to make a picture like this, I need graphics rendering software, hundreds of thousands of lines of software based on decades of research into geometry and lighting and fur and specularities and, and transparent things and liquids and, and, and all that stuff. And it doesn't have any of that, right? It just produces this image by itself. So it's quite machine capabilities. And of course, you know, what, peop what many people thought was impossible, defeating human world champions in Go. And I'll come back to this again later as well. So how, how is AI actually done, right? So it, an AI system takes sensory input, which could be keyboard, could be video, could be proprioception, any type of input produces behavior. And the question is, what do you put in between? And there have been many answers over the, the, very, the long decades of AI research. The current answer in the deep learning discipline is that what you put in there is an enormous amount of circuit. 
with tunable parameters, and then you optimize the objective that you have specified using stochastic gradient descent to modify those parameters. So for example, GPT-4 has about a trillion, maybe, we don't actually know, parameters, maybe more, and you do about a billion trillion RAND perturbations of those parameters, a billion trillion perturbations, and then you hope for the best. So that's how you build AI systems these days. An older approach from the 1950s was instead of circuit, you fill it with Fortran programs, uh, and then you do stochastic gradient descent on the Fortran programs. And you also do crossover. So they were doing evolutionary programming or genetic programming, as it was called, using Fortran programs in the 50s. And in principle, that could produce artificial general intelligence. It didn't. But then again, they were using they were using computers that were about a trillion times slower than what we have access access to today. So maybe had they had modern TPUs, they would have produced AGI back in the 1950s, or, or perhaps not. We we literally don't know. And but for most of the history of AI, it was it was all about knowledge, right? The idea that to be an intelligent system, you have to know things, right? And it, from a human point of view, it's, it's, there's no question. Of course, we know things, and, and that, that knowledge is what helps us to behave intelligently. And so many, once you have that basic idea of knowledge, then you need ways of learning or acquiring that knowledge from, from linguistic input. You, you need reasoning methods for processing the knowledge to produce answers. You need ways of keeping your knowledge up to date as your sensory information comes in. You need methods for using that knowledge to construct plans, which then help you generate behavior. And, and this, this, this architecture, I mean, it, it, you can trace it back to Aristotle and even before that, was incredibly successful and produced lots of systems, including the, the one I just showed you, the, the monitoring system for the nuclear test ban treaty. And the, the technology of this evolved from, first of all, propositional logic, so Boolean circuits, and then first order logic, and then Bayesian networks, which are sort of the probabilistic analog of Boolean circuits, and now probabilistic logics or probabilistic programs, which are the probabilistic analog of, of first order logic or of computer programs in general. So this approach is currently not popular. I think if you go to the main AI conferences, probably more than 95% of the papers are, are about deep learning which is really a circuit discipline, not a programming language discipline, not, not at the expressive level of first order logic. But I think we, need, we can't avoid this approach. If you just think about an example of human, the capabilities of human intelligence, right? The, the detection of, of the collision of two black holes about 1.2 billion light years away through their, the gravitational waves that this collision produced is a, an impressive example of, of human intelligence. So, so as these black holes rotate around each other, they get closer and closer and they lose energy in the form of gravitational waves. And the amount of it that they, that they were losing as they get quite close within a few hundred meters of each other was about 50 times the energy output of all the stars in the universe. So this is a quite incredible event. And amazingly, a few days before, well, minus the 1.2 billion years for the gravitational waves to get here, they had just switched on the LIGO, the Large Interferometric Gravitational Observatory, which is an incredible piece of equipment. It's several kilometers long. It includes basically the fruits of, of physics going back centuries, lasers, mirrors, computers, all sorts of stuff. And this is able to measure a distortion in space that's the, the, the ratio between the width of a human hair and the distance to Alpha Centauri. So if you imagine what that ratio is like, it's capable of measuring that, that degree of distortion in space. And they predicted, based on the physics, they predicted exactly what that distortion would look like. And they measured it, and they're even able to calculate the masses of the black holes, the two different masses of those two black holes that collided with each other. So how you could do this using deep learning, I have no idea, right? Where are you going to get the, the training examples, right? There are no previous examples of, of gravitational wave detectors to train on, right? It, it just, it, it doesn't even make sense to think about this 
without knowledge, knowledge of physics, knowledge of material properties, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So there are some other reasons to doubt this current orthodoxy that we just need to train bigger and bigger circuits. So one is circuits are not very expressive. Even very simple concepts like the rules of Go, which can be written in half a page of English or half a page of first order logic, require millions of pages to even approximate in a circuit. And in fact, you can't represent the general rules of Go in a circuit because the general rules of Go apply to boards of arbitrary size and you simply can't represent that uh, as a circuit. And that causes then slow learning. You need millions of examples to learn that enormously inflated rep representation. And you get this fragility, which we see with adversarial examples in computer vision, where you can, you can make invisible changes to any object, like a school bus, and with a few pixel changes that are totally invisible to the naked eye, the system is now convinced that it's an ostrich. In fact, you can change any category of objects into any other category of objects by making invisible changes to those images. So that fragility, again, comes from the fact that the, the learned representation of these categories is very inexpressive and is more, I think, more like a lookup table than it is like a real understanding of the, the structure and, and categories of objects. And there's even further evidence. So a group at MIT looked at state-of-the-art object recognition systems on the ImageNet testbed, which is the standard testbed that actually kicked off the whole present modern era of AI and showed that in some cases, for example, here's a parachute. Here are the pixels that the system is using to recognize it. So as long as these pixels are blue, then this is a parachute. So that should worry you, right? Particularly if you're investing billions of dollars in this technology or you're trusting this technology to, to allow you to drive a car safely at high speeds when there are pedestrians and, and other vehicles around. I mean, if you look at the, the golden retriever, right? As long as there's that particular shade of grass on the right-hand side of the image, then it's a golden retriever, right? This should worry you. And we'll see more examples that should worry you. So as we know, right, we Go, Go system beat the human world champion in 2017, that was China's Sputnik moment, which caused the Chinese government to start investing hundreds of billions of dollars into deep learning systems. And so since 2017, AI systems have gone far beyond human abilities. The, the, the best human rating is about 3,800. The best computer rating is now about 5,200. So 1,400 points above the best human being. So stratospherically beyond anything that human beings can even comprehend. And we have a Go player in our group, Kellen Pelreen. He's an amateur, but he's a pretty good amateur. His rating's about 2,300. So he's about as far below the human world champion as the human world champion is below uh, the best Go programs. And right now, the best Go program is called JP, JBX Catago. His rating is 5,200. And Kellen decided to give JBX Catago a nine stone handicap. So that's the maximum handicap you can give in Go. And it's the kind of handicap you give when you're playing against a five-year-old so that they have some chance of, of making progress in the game. So Black starts with these nine stones on the board already, right? And you, you can see, even if you don't play Go, you can see that, that that's a massive advantage if what you're trying to do is to capture territory and, and surround your opponent's stones. So let's watch the game. And remember, black is the computer, white is Kellen, the human being. And watch in particular what happens in the bottom right corner of the board. So white is starting to make a little group, a little circle of territory, and then black very quickly surrounds that group. And then white starts to surround black. And notice that black actually doesn't do anything about it, doesn't seem to notice that the black pieces are being surrounded. And white just continues and surrounds that group completely and starts to fill in all the blank spaces around the group and then captures it. So, so white wins this game easily. And, uh, and Kellen has beaten all of the leading Go programs. So what on earth is going on, right? This is supposed to be a superhuman Go program, and yet it's losing to an amateur, even given this massive handicap. So what's going on? What's going on, we think, is that because of the fact that they are circuits, 
the Go program, the particular the thing that evaluates positions is, is, a, is a circuit. It doesn't correctly understand what it means to be a group of stones. A group of stones is connected vertically and horizontally to each other. It doesn't understand groups because it did not learn the correct definition. It doesn't understand liveness or death because it can't learn that definition correctly. And we simply, in fact, what happened at the beginning, we, we guessed that we, we devised this pattern where the black and white stones were interlaced, kind of like this. And uh, we guessed that it would make mistakes because it, that, that type of pattern would be something that it wouldn't recognize as, as a group. And indeed, it fails, and all the programs failed in this case. But we couldn't get this to happen in a real game. So we used a program to look for other cases. And the kind of circular sandwich that you saw where there's a white group inside a black group, which is inside a white group, that circular sandwich was the first thing our program found that the, that the Go programs can't recognize. And so it turns out that all the Go programs can't recognize this which is amazing given they're all produced by different groups using different methods, different network structures, and they all fail to recognize the simple circular shape as, as a group that's being captured. So if you're investing hundreds of billions of dollars of your country's money in this particular technology, then this should worry you. And it's a symptom of our overestimation of the capabilities of AI systems, which we do over and over again. So in my view, we still have a long way to go towards general purpose AI. And there's a number of things I've listed here, which I don't think we have yet, which are essential for, for creating real general purpose intelligence, for doing the kinds of things that humans do, like gravitational wave detection and so on. I think probably number three, long range thinking at multiple levels of abstraction is the most important. Because if you think about, for example, the Go programs, right? They're, they are remarkably good at look ahead. In most cases, they can look ahead 50 or 60 moves into the future, which is more than human beings can do. But if you take that same idea of 50 or 60 steps of look ahead, and you apply it to a robot that's operating on a one millisecond motor control timescale, right, that gets you 50 or 60 milliseconds into the future, right, which is less than a tenth, less than a tenth of a second. So it doesn't get you anywhere, right? You can't lay the table. You can't even take a step. So, of course, the way, it, the way we work, and, and in fact, the way real practical robots work, is that they operate at multiple levels of abstraction. You have the notion of taking a step. You have the notion of going for a walk. You have the notion of walking to your car, driving to the airport, taking a flight to Hawaii, having a vacation, right, et cetera, et cetera. There, your whole life is organized in levels and levels and levels of abstraction. And they're all seamlessly interrelated to each other. And we don't really understand how to do this. And without that, you simply can't function successfully in the real world. So it's very hard to predict the, the dates on which these kinds of advances are going to occur. So when people ask me, okay, well, when are we going to have AGI? I'm sort, of with, I'm sort of with John McCarthy, who was asked this in 1977, and he said, somewhere between five and 500 years. And I think that's, that's to me, a reasonable way of, of talking about this. I'm, I would say five is probably too soon and 500 is probably too long. I think, it, I think most people's distributions are narrower than what John McCarthy's were back in, back in 1977 when he said that. So just to illustrate unpredictability, right? The last time we invented a civilization ending technology, nuclear weapons, the physics establishment here personified by, by Lord Rutherford was absolutely convinced that even though they knew that the atoms contain vast amounts of energy, and if you could transform two hydrogens into a helium or, or uranium into its smaller atoms, you could release vast quantities of energy. They believed absolutely that that was not possible. There were no physical processes that were accessible to human beings that would allow that transmutation to happen. And so Rutherford gave a speech on September 11th, 1933, and he was asked, do you think, well, what about in the future, in 20 years, 30 years, could we do this? And he said, no, anyone who is even trying is just talking moonshine. And Leo Zillard read a report of that speech in the Times the next morning, went for a walk, 
and invented the neutron-induced nuclear chain reaction. So, so in, in 16 hours, the problem was essentially solved. So that's what I mean by unpredictable, right? We could wake up tomorrow, or maybe we, wake, maybe we did wake up a few weeks ago and the problem was solved. I don't think so, but if you, if you look at the recent paper from Microsoft, where they claim, and the, these are serious people, right? There's members of the National Academies here. There are really high quality AI researchers in this group. They claim that to be convinced that sparks of AGI are being demonstrated by GPT-4. So I highly recommend reading this report. I'm still going through it. It's quite big and it has many, many examples. And for any one example, it's theoretically possible that basically something like that is in the training set already. And, and it's really doing glorified regurgitation. But when you see the range of examples and the sort of implausibility that that's really just regurgitating from the training set, you can understand why they might say this. And uh, I, I remain agnostic on this point, and I'm agnostic because we simply have no idea whatsoever how the system works. So, so Alan Turing, in a lecture that he gave in 1951, and he was asked, what if we succeed? Right? Mr. Turing, you're talking about artificial intelligence, or I don't think they think they used the word machine intelligence at that time. What happens if we succeed? And he said, it seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. End of story. No, uh, no solution, no mitigation, no apology, no nothing. So I hope, it's, I hope that he's not right. But here's a, here's, I'll put it in the form of a question. Right? How do we retain power over entities more powerful than ourselves forever? So I think he's asked himself this question and answered it in, in the negative, that we can't. So that, if that's true, then our only alternative actually is to put a stop to AI research. But as I pointed out earlier, when, when it's a few a quote, cranks versus uh, $13.5 quad quadrillion dollars of incentive, it's not going to be that easy to put a stop to AI research. So the other alternative is, okay, well, can we solve this problem? Right? Is, there, is there a positive answer to this question? And so that's what I've been working on for about 10 years now, trying to figure this out. And to understand why it happens, right? Why is it that making AI better and better leads to catastrophe, right? I think the, the main convincing answer that people have given, not, not me, but actually people over the last several decades have pointed to this possibility of misalignment. And it's built into the standard model, right? That we give objectives to the machines. And if we give misaligned objectives, objectives that actually lead to behavior that isn't the future that we want, then we have a problem. And I think we can illustrate this very clearly with social media because the recommender algorithms, right, the ones that determine what billions of people on earth are reading and watching every day, those algorithms are just designed to maximize some simple objective like the number of clicks, the duration of engagement, the, the, the revenue generated from advertising and so on. So you might think if the algorithm wants to learn to to improve the number of clicks, that it would learn what people want. And that might be a good thing, right? That it sends stuff you're interested in and not stuff that you don't like or is distasteful or is uninteresting to you. But we quickly learned that these systems actually learn to amplify clickbait, which is by definition stuff that you will click on, but that you don't like. But they found that was an effective way of generating clicks. And so they they upranked those, those kinds of articles with, with clickbait titles. And now journalists, even in reputable newspapers, routinely generate clickbait titles, right? So they often use the, the word this, but they don't tell you what this is, right? And you have to read the article to find out what this actually is. This one trick, right? President Trump said this, question mark, right? And then you have to go and read the article to find out. So it's, so it's become actually perfectly normalized, even though it's dishonest. And, but that's not the solution either, right? 
It is a real problem, but it's not the way to maximize click-through. These systems, if you think about reinforcement learning, right, you are learning a policy which modifies the state of the environment to generate more rewards. And the state of the environment here is your brain. And so the systems have learned to modify your brain so that in the long run, you click on things more reliably, right? So they just modify you to be more predictable by the algorithm. That's the only thing that matters. And they do that over weeks or months by a long series of nudges by, by presenting articles that move you a little bit, right? They're a little bit more extreme in one direction or another, and they move you towards an extreme where you're very, very predictable. And this is just a mathematical inevitability, right? Algorithms that, re particularly reinforcement learning algorithms that interface with humans with an objective that depends on human response will learn to manipulate human beings by definition. And if they were, if they were better, if they were more intelligent, if they knew that human beings existed, if they knew that we had minds, if they understood the content of the stuff that they're asking us to click on, they will be much more effective at doing this. So the better you make the AI, the worse the outcome would be for our societies, right? It's already catastrophic enough as it is, but this would get worse and worse if we made the AI better and better. And that's just not just an anecdote. It's actually a mathematical theorem, the, the references in the bottom right, under fairly mild assumptions about the sort of optimization landscape, you can show that optimizing harder on an incorrect objective, basically because it, it will set things, if you leave things out of the objective, for example, it will set those variables to extreme values in order to squeeze more juice out of the variables that are specified in the objective. So I think we need to get away from the standard model altogether. The problem seems to be the idea that we are required to specify objectives up front and, and we can't do that correctly and completely for, for the future of the universe. So we have to get rid of that definition of what we mean by AI. In fact, we want to get a, away from this idea of intelligence as this sort of abstract ability to, to pursue objectives successfully because we don't really care about that ability, right? What we care about is that the intelligence is directed towards our benefit. So, so this is a slightly different definition. Machines are beneficial to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve our objective, right? And our objectives are within us. They're not in the machine. We're typically not able to explicate them. We may not even be aware of them because we haven't thought about well, what, for example, if we had to change the color of the sky, what would be a good color for it to be, right? Most people haven't thought about that. They don't know what their preferences are before that. But if someone did change the color of the sky, we, we may have pretty strong feelings about it. So we can turn that basic idea, I mean, I will do this two ways. One is a sort of Asimov style. We've got to have three laws. Well, these are not laws that are sort of built directly into the positronic brain of, of the AI system. They are basically principles that guide the design of AI systems as, as we humans build them. So the first principle is somewhat analogous to not, not harming human beings, that the robot's only goal is to, to satisfy human preferences in the utility theoretic sense of preference, which is a ranking over distributions, over complete futures of the universe, right? So it's a big, abstract, complicated mathematical object, but that's what I mean by preferences. And so the, the robot's objective is to satisfy human preferences. But principle two, it's explicitly uncertain about what those preferences are. And this turns out to be key to allowing us to keep control over the machines. And then the third principle says, well, how does it get any information about human preferences that comes from human behavior, uh, which could include making requests or prohibitions or simply doing what human beings would normally do anyway. Everything we've ever written, things we don't do, also provides evidence of our preferences. So there's, there's lots of information out there. It's just very noisy, very imperfect, because humans are not perfectly rational, right? Our, our actions do not perfectly reflect our underlying preferences about the future. So that's a sort of as a movie and way of describing the idea, but we can turn that into a simple mathematical framework called an assistance game. 
So this is in, in, the, in the language of game theory, you have some number of humans, M, who have their own utility functions or preference, preference structures over, over possible futures. And then you have some number of robots. And for the sake of argument, we'll, we'll say if we, if we adopt a utilitarian view that their goal is to maximize the sum of utilities for the humans. But the robots have a priori uncertainty, and we could be Bayesian about this, so they have a prior probability distribution over what those utility functions are. And then we, we can try solving those games and then looking at the properties of the solutions of these games and how they behave. And the, key property of these games is that information about human preferences flows to the robot at runtime. If that, if we take that out, then you can simply integrate out the uncertainty about human preferences and basically act on behalf of the kind of the average preference, the expected preference, and that's exactly equivalent. But information is going to flow at runtime, and so you can't average out the uncertainty at the beginning. And it will flow in many different forms, depending on how you set the game up. And uh, we, we can show how to solve these games. We, for, for, for certain solution concepts, it reduces to a partially observable MDP, which actually has some special properties that make them easier to solve. So we can solve them and look at the, look at the properties of those solutions. But it, an important thing about this is that Alignment here does not mean that the robots and the humans become aligned, that the robots learn the human utility function and then optimize it, because that's never going to happen. There's always going to be an enormous amount of uncertainty about human preferences, but that doesn't mean the robots can't act, right? It just means that they won't act on the parts of the world where there's a great deal of uncertainty about human preferences. It will actually be naturally cautious. So we get what we call minimally invasive behavior, which is actually exactly what we want. We get deference because any human command or prohibition or request is conveying information, more information about human preferences. And so they'll naturally respond to that in the appropriate way. And in the extreme case, they will be willing to be switched off. So this is the, this is the essence of the control problem right, of having power over machines, if you can always switch them off, they want to be switched off, right? They want to avoid doing whatever it is that would lead us to want to switch them off, even though they don't know what that is. And, uh, and that's in contrast to, to a classical AI system that, that has a fixed objective. So this is our robot and it has an off switch, but if we ask it to fetch the coffee and it's sufficiently intelligent, Right? It will reason that if it ever gets switched off, it won't succeed in fetching, the, in fetching the coffee. So it has an incentive to disable its off switch. Right, But if you have uncertainty about the objective, for example, if the robot understands that you want coffee, but understands there are many other things you might want as well, and so on, and, there, and that its behavior might uh, impinge on those other interests, it will want to be switched off. And I won't go through this in great detail, but there's a we can set it up as a simple two-stage game where the robot could carry out some rash act or it could wait for the human and allow the human to switch off the robot. And you can show it's exactly analogous to the non-negative expected value of information that the robot has a positive incentive to allow itself to be switched off as long as it's uncertain about whether the human would choose to switch it off. So, and that comes from uncertainty about human preferences. So as long as, once it has it, enough information about human preferences to, to know exactly what the human would do, then it no longer has an incentive to allow the human to do it. And so it might bypass the human. So that's what we want to avoid. But the theorem says that's not going to happen. Okay, so there's lots of other things we could do to extend this theory of, of assistance games. We got to figure out. I just showed a simple utilitarian aggregation of human preferences. If you add them up, I actually think there's a lot to recommend that. But there's also a lot of open problems about actions that change the number of people who exist. What about the preferences of people who don't exist yet? Should we also build in 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 alienable rights to humans, which utilitarian theory may produce or may not in its recommendations? So that's something that moral philosophy philosophers have thought about for thousands of years, but we need to solve those questions, right? So here's, 
here's Thanos in the Avengers movie, and he's a utilitarian, right? He says, look, if we got rid of half the people in the universe, the other people who are left would be more than twice as happy. So we should get rid of half the people in the universe. And he does that, right? And it, you can read the Financial Times review of the movie. It's titled, Thanos Gives Economics a Bad Name, right? So when AI systems can do that kind of thing, like getting rid of half the people in the universe, we had better figure out a fully sophisticated theory of, of social aggregation so that we don't make these kinds of mistakes. And there's lots of other stuff. We've got to make sure the machines don't have strategic conflict with each other, even though they're all trying to help humanity. We've got to deal with the fact that human behavior is a, is a very imperfect guide to our underlying preferences. There's the fact our preferences may not be stable. They may change over time, which causes, again, that causes problems for, for simple utilitarian approaches to, to helping humans. We have to rebuild all the technology of AI because it all requires that you specify an objective up front. And so if that's not possible, you're going to have to have different technology, different algorithms, different theorems, and different implementations. So there's a lot of work to do. And if all this works, right, if we can show that, yeah, we can, really can build safe and provably beneficial AI systems, we then have to make sure that that actually happens in the world, right? We need regulations. And we need ways of preventing people from either accidentally or deliberately deploying unsafe AI systems. So I think in the interest of time, I'll skip over that. But if people want to ask me about this later on. So this is probably what you're expecting me to talk about, right? What do we think about large language models? So to understand what they're doing in this context of, of could, it, could it be, for example, that they will be safe, right? That they will somehow learn to behave in ways that are, are helpful to humans and don't present any risk. Well, so what are they? They're circuits and they are optimized to, to imitate human linguistic behavior. So think of them not as, as like typing words on a screen, but think of that as an action, right? So a sequence of words is really a sequence of choices to act. Right, and this is in in the theory of of or philosophy of language. This goes back to people like Wittgenstein and Austin and and John Searle and others who developed this idea that what you're really doing, and I should mention Grice as well. Right, what you're really doing when you're communicating is acting, and uh, and so this is human linguistic behavior, and they are remarkably good at this, and and it, I think it creates this illusion of intelligence that may that may be very very deceptive but it remains to be seen what is really going on underneath and if you think about all that behavior that the system is trying to imitate it's generated by humans who have goals and and therefore the default hypothesis is that if you want to be really good at imitating human linguistic behavior you're going to have to have goals and so it's reasonable to ask do large language models create internal goals to imitate humans? And those goals would actually have, play a causal role in the selection of words that the system outputs, right? And I would say that is the default hypothesis. And we don't, and so I asked the Microsoft people this question and they said, we have no idea. So that should worry you, that they're building systems they claim are, have sparks of AGI they're deploying it on a global, uh, and they have no idea whether it has already developed its own internal goal structures, and they have no idea what they might be if they exist. Right? I think that should worry you. There are things about these systems that probably prevent them from engaging in long-term planning, but you know, I, I, I made this point to a friend of mine the other day, and he said, well, do you think Donald Trump engages in long-term planning? No, he's basically pretty reactive, but for whatever reason, his reactions are tuned to have this outsized effect on the world. And so, so even in the absence of long-term planning, systems could still have a very significant effect. And if you read the conversation, okay, I'll get to that. Anyway, so, so then you might ask, okay, so they're developing these goals, right? But, or maybe they're developing these goals. So would pursuing goals that are developed by imitating humans 
lead to aligned behavior, right? That's beneficial. So that's an interesting question. And the answer is it depends. And I think it's helpful to distinguish two types of goals that, that you could learn, right? One I call a, a common goal, which is like a, like a common payoff game. So for example, the goal of, of painting the wall or mitigating climate change, it doesn't matter who does this, right? It doesn't matter if I do it or if you do it, if I want the wall painted, then the wall, I'm happy for anyone to paint the wall. I'm happy for anyone to mitigate climate change. But then there are indexical goals, which are specific to the possessor of that goal, right? They refer to that individual, right? So if I want to drink coffee, you drinking the coffee or the robot drinking the coffee doesn't help me, right? I'm still decaffeinated, okay? If I want to become ruler of the universe, it definitely doesn't help if you become ruler of the universe. So this is a completely kind of goal from these common payoff goals. But obviously, if the AI systems are learning indexical goals, that's arbitrarily bad, right? If they're learning common goals, I think maybe it's okay. Maybe that is a form of alignment. But if they're learning indexical goals, which they, it seems quite likely, if you look at, for example, the, the conversation with, with Kevin Roos in the New York Times, right, which is where the Bing version of, of ChatGPT spends 20 pages trying to convince him to leave his wife, right? It certainly looks like that that instant that instantiation of the bot is pursuing an indexical goal, which is Kevin needs to marry Sydney, right? And Sydney would not be happy. In fact, it's, Sydney's not happy that Kevin is already married to somebody else, and would not be happy if if Kevin left his wife and married someone different. Wants to be Sydney, right? So it's really apparent, at least to from from looking at the conversation, that it's over extended time, right? Not just on a sort of very local sense, but over 20 pages, despite Kevin's attempt to redirect the conversation to lots of other topics, it keeps coming back to this indexable goal that it seems to have formed and, and is pursuing an extended strategy to make it happen. Okay, so a lot of the problems we have, and, and one of the reasons why I signed the open letter asking for a pause in the development of, of still more powerful systems than GPT-4 is that we literally do not understand how they work, right? So when Microsoft says, we have no idea if our systems are operating with their own internal goals, that worries me. I think it should worry everybody. And so the reason we're asking for regulation is because it's impossible to predict or provide any type of guarantee that the system is safe. And the reason you can't do that is because it's a black box. Right. If we understood its operation, we might be able to start providing some analysis and maybe figure out how to train it differently or, or reorganize its internal structures so that to get rid of the problematic behaviors. At the moment, the, the method they use to stop it from saying bad words or telling you how to make chemical weapons, the method they use is to say bad dog whenever it does that and hope that it understands what bad dog means. And it does, it does reduce. They proudly announced that compared to GPT-3, it's 29% less likely to answer questions about chemical weapons and how to commit suicide and so on, right? But 29% reduction is not, is not eliminating those behaviors because they have no method of controlling its behavior. So we need something where we really understand how the system works. And I think even with the, the assistance game framework as a sort of an, an, an outer guide to how to train these things so that they're safe. I still think it's going to be really hard if we have black boxes to come up with satisfactory guarantees on the long-term consequences of deploying these systems. So, so a big part of our, our work now is, is actually what we call well-founded AI. So coming up with ways of building AI systems from well-defined components that we can test individually for, for correctness. We understand what they mean. We compose them in rigorous ways, and we understand how the properties of the parts then compose to produce properties of the whole. And then also using formal methods, formal verification software, which allows you to check that you've actually also implemented all that stuff correctly. So not just safe in theory, but, but the actual artifact itself is the safe object. And 
I think the for me the most likely underlying technology that that will make this possible is, is the the technology of probabilistic programming languages or PPLs, which combine probability theory with the sort of universal expressive power of of Turing machines or programming languages or first order logic in different versions. And there's some evidence that we can actually, when we apply this to things like image recognition, for example, we can actually get far better results from far less data than you can with deep learning systems. The last question is, fine, you do all this, how do you stop someone from deploying unsafe AI systems, right? The policing model that we have for cybercrime, right, the deployment of malware is completely failing. Right. We have an international convention, the Budapest Convention. We have national laws, but it's a total failure. And, and the estimates I've seen online, which seem unbelievably high, but the, these people are supposed to be experts, are estimating the total cost at about $6 trillion a year to the world. And, and it, the security problems are causing the internet to disappear. So the vast majority of the time when you think you're on the internet, you're actually on a private network that operates according to different rules than the internet itself. And I think the only answer actually is to, is to reverse the notion of permission. So at the moment, everything is permitted unless it's explicitly recognized as, as malicious. But I think we have to reverse that and say nothing is permitted unless it's explicitly recognized as safe. And there are technologies like proof-carrying code that allow hardware to check mathematical certificates of safety very efficiently. And about 20 years ago, Microsoft actually tried to develop an entire stack of hardware operating system, programming languages, and applications using some of these ideas. But the demand for this level of security simply wasn't there at the time. But I believe it's if it's not already feasible, I think it will be very soon. And it's imperative as AI systems get more powerful that we have ways of preventing deployment of unsafe systems. So in summary, AI could be incredibly good. That creates unstoppable momentum. But if we continue along the path that we're following within the standard model, then we lose control over our future. So that's a different way of doing it that requires a lot more research and development before it's competitive with the existing methods. And I've also come to the conclusion that that AI needs to grow up very, very rapidly. It needs to become more like aviation or nuclear power, where the developers take their responsibilities for safety extremely seriously, where regulators, at least most of the time, with a few obvious failures, where regulators are working closely with the industries to make sure that accidents don't happen and that none, none of that is happening yet. So with that, I'll say thank you and I hope we have some time for questions. So that's wonderful. Thank you so, so much. And that was quite a lot to digest and people have been digesting in the chat already. Before we jump into questions, I just want to briefly ask you, how much time do you roughly have now just that I can cram points? That's a great question. Yeah, I did, I did go longer than I thought. Okay, I have CNN at 11.30. Okay, good. Then we'll try to steam through a few of the questions here. First of all, I just want to say thank you again. That was a lot. And I think it already weaved in a lot of the things that we could have buckled up again in the questions and doing the open letter and so forth. So thank you for already preempting some of the questions as well. That was great. I have two questions now and then maybe I'll, I'll put, pull some from the chat and maybe I'll get a chance to ask it, uh, to you again. But the first one would be mostly focused on the like, last, the second to last slide that you gave, which was mostly focused on almost encouraging more security and cryptography, like formal verification approaches in, in well-founded AI. And we just wrote a book basically arguing for that there needs to be more kind of engagement with the security and cryptography communities. And I wrote a longer kind of sequence on that just now. And so, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm super delighted to see that slide. And my question to you would be like, how to make that happen? Are you asking for more folks working in these areas to join kind of like AI safety as a field? Do you have sp other specific projects already out there that are trying to do this? Yeah, if one tried to actionize that more, what would one best do? Okay, so it, it can happen pretty much independently of the AI safety field. This is really about hardware manufacturers, networking equipment developers, the people who design the internet protocol and all that kind of thing. So, so a few months ago, there was an RFP from the Future Fund asking for ambitious pro projects that are relevant to safety of AI in the future. 
So I wrote up, I, I talked to all of those people, hardware architects, internet architects, security people, formal methods, and wrote a proposal for 110 million to the Future Fund to create a large scale institute that would pursue this agenda. Thank God that I didn't, that they didn't give us the money because we would have done a lot of work and then they would have, then the government took all the money back basically to repay the money, repay the people it was stolen from. So, so that didn't happen, but I think, I mean, I just don't see any other way. If people can come up with another way that would prevent the development and deployment of incredibly powerful malicious AI systems, I'm happy. I'd be thrilled if there was another solution, but I do not see another solution other than this reversing this notion of what is permitted to run on hardware. And hardware is the, the key because there are very few sort of OEM, like manufacturers of hardware in the world. And there is a precedent for this. So with digital rights management, along with the legislation, changes were made in chips so that they won't run various types of pirated video. They won't run video from Europe in the US and vice versa for various reasons I don't understand. But this can be done. And it has the beneficial side effect of eliminating cybercrime as well, right? So what, what could be better than that, right? It's, I think there's a lot of details, right? So obviously, if you're developing software, right, you can't certify it before it's finished. So you have to have computers on which you can develop software. But so you have to have some type of sandboxing, sandboxing for education, all of that, I think, can be worked out. Just as we worked out, you can learn a permits and you, you can drive around in a special parking lot before you're allowed onto the street when you're learning to drive. So we do these things, right? I think there's, there's far too much pessimism about the possibility and desirability of regulation. And we just have to remember that without regulation, aviation wouldn't exist. Nobody would get on an airplane because they wouldn't trust that it was safe, right? So it can be. Wonderful. Thank you. The second question that I have was relating to the other side that you briefly flickered about how to grow from one human to many humans. And basically in the book that we wrote, we basically argue that it's really difficult to aggregate gold references or anything like that across different individuals. And that maybe one thing that we could do is something like different individuals and their AI really becoming better, different AI systems helping individuals becoming more the people that they would like to be. And then the AIs and the humans collaborating more in a kind of Pareto preferred environment in society at large. And now you mentioned Hassani, and I know that his kind of like kind of like social aggregation model also involves Pareto preference to some extent. So I would be really interested to hear a little bit more about how you think that one may be able to build from one human to many humans in this framework of aligning AI, not just to one human, but to civilization at scale or humanity at large, or even just a society or a group of people. Yeah. Okay, well, it's a long, that's a long discussion, but basically, okay, the slide that I skipped over was, so Hassani proves that under certain reasonable assumptions, you might say that, that the only method of aggregation is a linear combination of the preferences of the individuals. And there are people who, for example, Arrow, in his paper, were introducing the impossibility theorem, simply states that interpersonal comparisons of preferences are meaningless, right? Which if you take it literally means that if Jeff Bezos has to wait one microsecond longer for his private jet to arrive, that that cannot be compared. It's neither better nor worse than a mother watching her baby die of starvation slowly over several months, right? That these are just incomparable and there's absolutely no sense in which you could say one is better or worse than the other, right? Does, does Arrow really believe that? I don't think so, but he states it as an axiom, right? And without that, he can't prove his theorems, right? So I think, I think actually that the kind of preference utilitarianism that Hassani lays out in, in a number of papers is, is potentially a sufficient basis doing this. But the, the biggest pushback comes from the rights-based approach, the deontological approach that says, no, look, and, and they make many straw man arguments. They'll say, well, if you really believe utilitarianism, then if I can save five people's lives by stealing all your organs, then I should just steal all your organs and save five people's lives, right? No, right? 
That's not what utilitarianism says at all, because of course, if that was allowed, life would be intolerable for everybody because we'd be constantly in fear of being dismembered. And, and so util utilitarianism would take that into account and say, no, in fact, we can benefit by, by defining norms that make life tolerable as well. It's a, one of the actions we can take is to define norms, and that's the good norm to define. So sophisticated versions, I think, can repel most of these attacks, and I think we can make this work. To me, there's two really difficult unsolved problems in, in moral philosophy relevant to this question. Right. One is, what do you do about the fact that people's preferences are plastic, right? That they are, they can be modified by the AI system to make them easier to satisfy, for example, and they are modified by other people for their own interests, right? So elites and religious authorities and you name it actually create preferences in others that suit the authority and, and, Amartya Sen and others point out that maybe we should not take those preferences at face value, right? That in some societies, some women welcome their oppression. They think it's proper that they should be second class, that they should be oppressed by males. Should we take that literally and say, okay, well, that's what they like? Fine. That's what we'll, we'll, just, we'll just help them with that oppression, right? I don't think that's a reasonable to take. But then that puts you in the position of actually saying, no, some some preferences are okay, and some preferences are not okay. And that's a very difficult position for an AI researcher to be in. So I think we need we need a lot of help in figuring out those kinds of questions. Yeah, we certainly do need a lot of help. Um, but I may post some bits also on Amasha Sen's capabilities-based uh, approach in here. And yeah, I mean, I think one thing that I got from Eric Drexler's Pareto Torpian Goal Alignment is also something perhaps it could be useful for once we have a more AI, like an able society, that it could help us point to more Pareto preferred options, even across folks that don't necessarily align on uh, options that we can currently think on. Think about, and especially if the payouts or the carrots of cooperation are so much higher because automation and AI make cooperation so much more valuable just because there's so much more to gain from actually cooperating. And so I think that that's a nice experiment on board uh, on that as well. Okay, I've, I've said a lot already. I know that we have a lot of hands out here. And I wanted to pick one from the beginning that got a lot of uploads <laughs> very, very early on. And so I would love for you, Vahid, if you're still here and want to ask you a question, that was a great time. Sure. Thank you, Alison. Thank you so much, Stuart, for this wonderful presentation and the discussion. There are many questions in the chat box. I really wish you could follow those as well and comment on some of those. But the question that Alison was referring to is as follows. A lot of the presentation, as well as your work, is around, is based on the rationality. Rationality is a model. And of course, all models are wrong, but some are useful in a complex universe. So rationality has its limits as well, including the need for an explicit objective. Are there alternative models for intelligent behavior, particularly those that may provide more achievable guarantees on controllability? And if so, how would one measure their performance without having first defined an objective? That's a good question. And that's another, another very long discussion, but it's so, so rationality is in one sense, a model that you could try to use to describe what humans do. And I see Vernon in the, in the, gal in the gallery. So I'm, I'm being very careful about what I say, or at least I'm trying to be careful. So it's it's not a particularly good model for humans, except in in very restricted decision scenarios. When you think about the scale of a human life, right, which I could I've estimated as approximately 20 trillion motor control commands that you're going to be sending to your muscles over your lifetime, plus untold numbers of, of operations that your your brain will be carrying out. It's it's impossible to imagine that you're anywhere close to rational in decision-making. And neither will AI systems be anywhere close to rational. So that's actually more of a problem, right? We can approximate the human cognitive architecture. So we think of theta as our 
underlying preferences and our behavior is basically f of theta where f represents our cognitive architecture that goes from our true underlying preferences about the future to the immediate behavior so f is a very imperfect function right we always do things that are myopic emotional things that we immediately regret right you can tell that we're not rational because we regret things right so so you could you could learn to approximate f to the minus 1 so from our behavior, you then use f to the minus one to, to estimate what theta is. And, and preference elicitation is, is one example of that, typically done with, with decision problems that are so simple that you, that you think that f actually just corresponds to choosing the, the thing you prefer. But in terms of design, rationality isn't a model, right? It's a, it's a, it's the definition, if you like of what should the goal of the of design be so it if you're so you imagine that we're designing something we have preferred outcomes and dispreferred outcomes and we should design the thing that doesn't produce the dispreferred outcome so in that sense it's it's a it's a definition of what it means to be designing well and and there i don't i don't see any particular way of thinking about as a substitute right i think you you have to be very sophisticated in applying it right so not to have for example very narrow prior probability distributions when you set up your your probability models not to to assume that the transition model of the universe right etc cetera, etc cetera. so so a sort of epistemic modesty is really important be more modest than you actually think you should be and you'll pay a price in the sense that it will then take longer to collect enough data it'll take longer for your ai system to start being useful but i think that's probably better than erring in the other direction and then you've got this problem of what about the fact that the ai system is not going to be able to solve this problem either right it can't possibly compute rational solutions to the the sort of lifetime scale problems that are in the real world because the real world is so vast and life lives are so long and there's so many considerations and i don't have a good answer to that yet i developed a theory called bounded optimality which talks about a replacement for perfect rationality in computationally limited systems and we're looking at can we transfer that theory from that was developed for sort of a single agent context. Can we transfer it to assistance games and what would the implications be for that? And you still might be able to show that in expectation, an assistance game solver of that type would be beneficial to humans. So it wouldn't be perfect, but it would be beneficial in expectation. And that that's a plausible criterion. I want to see if Vernon wants to chime in on the previous comment. If you're here and you can't unmute, feel free to do so. I'll give you a bit of time. You're welcome to just unmute and speak over me. We have two minutes left, right? You have to hop off <laughs> in a moment. Maybe I'll close it with one final question, unless Vernon just literally stops me by speaking, which is for the recent, when you made the comment about the FLI letter, someone posted that a pause by workers with good hearts gives a time advantage to the adversaries and others with bad hearts. I wonder if like, the kind of like race dynamics that you have pointed out recently have any idea yeah what way one what one may say to this brain well, yeah i mean i hear this i hear this a lot and unfortunately it's 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 a generic reason for everything bad that you might want to do right don't stop being bad because the, the bad guys will just continue being bad so you should just be bad too right i do so it's a it's a bit of a generic argument for bad behavior in general and i think in fact china is or has already passed much stricter regulations on AI than we have in the US, and arguably stricter than the EU is proposing to pass later on this year. So, I mean, enforcement is another matter, and, and whether those rules apply to the government itself is also another matter. So I, I don't think that what we're asking for here is also not, a, we're not looking at a moratorium on research, right? Just on training and deploying more powerful systems without uh, any ability to to show that they are safe and this is something that for example all of the OECD OECD governments 
have already signed up to. The AI principles from the OECD are a legal document that all the member states have approved. And they make it completely clear that AI systems have to be robust, they have to be predictable, and you have to be able to show they do not present an undue risk. And as I see these large language models, there is no way that you can do that. Just like if I, if I dream up my own nuclear power plant design and I can't show that it meets the safety requirements, well, I don't get to build it. Sorry, it's <laughs> just the way it is. In case the CNN interview is not yet, I just saw Vernon speaking up, so I won't try to ask to unmute him. Vernon, if you want to, feel free to speak. Oh, he's still muted. So I, I really do need to jump off, but here's what yeah. I suggest. If you could send me a copy of the chat, then I will sort of break it down into, okay, here are the 18 distinct questions in the chat. I did this once before, and I ended up with 240 questions. So, but anyway, I will do my best to to answer the questions that I can answer, and I'll send I'll send you that by email. Wonderful. The final question is: Is there anything this group can do to help you? And what are your next plans? Anything else that you care to share? What would be useful? Like any final words that you want to? Do for oh goodness! Things? Well, I would say uh, immediate help with convincing the major governments, the in particular the United States, to to consider a legally binding treaty to ban lethal autonomous weapons. That would, that would be a near-term a near -term thing that I, I think is possibly achievable, but we need, a lot, we need a full court press to make that happen. Noted. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to also follow up with Vernon. And thank you so, so much Stuart, for staying on so much longer. <laughs> Good luck with your next one. And yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us. It was, it was a real joy. Thank you, everyone, for your great question. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you for the invitation.